started recording okay um so at the end of last lecture i mentioned that the smallest three connected non planar cubic graph that is not three edge colorable is the peterson graph um note that i don't need to say non planar of course it is non planar because the planar ones are three edge colorable because the four color theorem is true right so um of course it is non planar because we know the planar ones are actually three edge colorable right good um so are there any questions or concerns pertaining to anything we have discussed so far especially the proof of uh, tate's theorem that we discussed in the last lecture it's fairly non trivial especially the second direction where we start from a three edge coloring and you construct a proper four face coloring so if there are any questions or concerns regarding that uh, now is a good time to raise them right and uh, if not we will move on to uh, coloring arbitrary graphs not necessarily planar okay so if not then um, let's move on to the next part of this module where we are talking about coloring arbitrary graphs okay so we are no longer dealing with planar graphs or graphs embedded in the plane right okay good so let's start with a few definitions um the chromatic number of a graph which you might have seen in previous courses is the minimum number of colors so that the graph admits a proper vertex coloring with that many colors okay and uh, one way to state the four color theorem is that if g is a loopless planar graph then the chromatic number of g is at most 4 right you need at most four colors no more than that okay and uh, note that the graph is k vertex colorable if and only if the chromatic number is at most k okay so in particular if your graph is a uh, three vert if your graph chromatic number um okay if your graph is for example three vertex colorable right then it is also five vertex colorable right so you it's okay if you don't use some colors that's not a problem right so to be k vertex colorable just means that the chromatic number is at most k uh, but we will also sometimes refer to the actual value of the chromatic number and in that case we will say that the graph is k chromatic if the chromatic number is exactly k okay uh good so let's start with some observations also we can basically restrict ourselves to simple graphs clearly our graphs have no loops because if there is a loop then you cannot color the vertex with any number of colors uh but it, multiple edges don't matter because they don't uh, they don't add any additional constraints either two vertices are adjacent by one edge or they are adjacent by any number of edges it doesn't matter right? so we can uh, pretend that our graphs are simple what we really need is that they are loopless right okay so when is the chromatic number equal to 1 can anyone tell me for uh, a trivial graph exactly there are no edges right okay so and in particular if your graph has an edge then the chromatic number is at least 2 so if the edge set is not empty then when is the chromatic number exactly equal to 2 by by thank you right and so then of course the next natural question that arises is um can we characterize
um, graphs with chromatic number equal to three. Right, so of course, characterize is a somewhat vague term, but uh, typically when I use characterize, I mean um, a nice characterization, which would, in CS th uh, theory terms, it would lead it to a polynomial time algorithm, um, right, something like that. And unfortunately, the answer is no. Uh, so for those of you who are familiar with uh, the com some complexity theoretic terms like NP hardness and NP completeness, um, deciding, so the fact that of course is not uh, within the purview of this course, deciding whether the chromatic number is equal to three or it is greater than three is NP complete. Um, so I'll say a few words about that in, in particular. Computing the chromatic number of a graph is an NP hard problem. And what all of this means for those of you who may not be familiar with CS theory complexity terms is that um, there is no efficient algorithm unless the famous conjecture P not equals NP is false. So you basically don't expect there to be a polynomial time or an efficient algorithm for either of these problems, deciding whether it is equal to three or equal to K for any K greater than or equal to three. Um, and if you want to think of it as a computation problem, then it's an NP hard problem. Okay. So of course, uh, this is not really, um, I mean, these kinds of results we won't be proving in this course. We are going to focus on the graph theoretic stuff and not go into complexity theory or anything. How many of you are not at all familiar with NP hardness or NP completeness? Just to get a sense, I'd like to understand so if anyone is not really familiar with NP hardness and NP completeness, maybe just put it in the chat box. Okay, looks like most of you are minimally familiar with these things. Great. Okay, so that's some bad news. We can't expect to characterize uh, these graphs. Right, uh, but maybe we can get some bounds. So maybe we can discuss some bounds. Again, unfortunately, the lower bounds we are going to discuss are also not computable. We'll just discuss them anyways. Um, and then we'll talk about an upper bound which is computable. Okay, so let's start with some um, easy lower bounds. For the chromatic number. Okay, so I want to discuss two lower bounds of it that are quite easy to prove. Um, what is the chromatic number of a complete graph on P vertices? If all your vertices are adjacent, then you're going to need to give um, a different color to each one of them. So the best you can do is uh, use P colors, right? Thanks, An. Right? And um, observe that if H is a subgraph of G, then the chromatic number of G is lower bounded by the chromatic number of H, right? So if you're in particular, if your graph has a complete subgraph on P vertices, then the chromatic number is at least P, okay? So we are going to introduce a term just in case we need it later. Um, so a set S of the vertex set of a graph is a stable set 
if sorry i mean something else my bad <laughs> is a clique if all vertices of s are pairwise adjacent right uh, which is the same as saying that the graph induced by s is complete and if your graph has multiple edges then you can say up to multiple edges right so actually yeah up to multiple edges and loops because in that case uh, anyways doesn't really matter with our task on loops i just want the definition to be consistent with the rest of the course okay so for example in this graph these three vertices they comprise a stable set Oh, sorry, and then uh, a clique. <laughs> sorry, I'm keeping on mixing up these two terms. Um, right, so this is a clique. And if your graph has a clique of a certain size, then the chromatic number is going to be at least uh, the size of the clique, right? So that brings us to the clique number of a graph. It's uh, denoted as omega of G. And it is the maximum size of a clique in G. Okay. So in this particular graph, it's fairly clear that there is no clique of size four. So omega of G in this case is three. Okay. And that brings us to the first lower bound, where the chromatic number is at least omega of g, the clique number of the graph. OK? Good. So that's one lower bound. Uh, unfortunately, the problem is, um, from a computational point of view, if you're concerned about that, this is also not really computable. Computing the clique number of a graph is uh, yet another NP-hard problem. So no good news there. From a purely mathematical point of view, well, it's interesting. Good. All right. Um, so now I want to talk about the opposite notion of a clique, which is called a stable set. So let me start with the question. If S is a clique in a graph G, so it's a set of vertices, uh, where all the vertices are pairwise adjacent, then um, what does S look like in the complement graph? Anyone? You can think of G as a simple graph because we only define complements for simple graphs. So what does a clique look like in the complement graph? It's a pair of non-adjacent vertices, right? And that's what we're going to call a stable set. A set S of the vertex set of a graph is a stable set if the vertices in S are pairwise 
non-adjacent, which is the same as saying that the graph induced by the set S has no links or no edges in a loopless graph, right? So in our example that we had earlier, actually let's uh, draw a different example. Maybe let's do the Peterson graph and let's see if we can compute uh, by inspection the size of a maximum stable set in the Peterson graph. All vertices in the Peterson graph are the same. That's uh, what is called a vertex transitive graph. So I'm going to pick this vertex in my stable set. Actually, I can use colors, no? Um, right. So let me pick this uh, red colored vertex. Okay. Now I can't pick any of its neighbors. So I can't pick these guys. <coughs> On the outside five cycle, I could pick one of these two and clearly those are symmetric possibilities. So let me pick uh, this guy, for instance. Well, then I can't pick this guy and I can't pick this guy. So now I can pick any of the th remaining three vertices. Um, if I pick this guy here, then I can't pick any of its two neighbors. So that won't give me a very big stable set. Instead, I can pick these two remaining guys. And that gives me a stable set of size four in the Peterson graph. And by the logic we went through, it is a maximum uh, stable set. Okay. So um, we are going to have a similar number. The stability number of a graph G, uh, it's denoted as alpha of G, and it's equal to the size, the maximum size of a stable set in G. Okay. Um, Typically in computer science, uh, the term that is more common is um, independent set. And in that case, uh, people call this the independence number of the graph, right? But I'll be sticking to Bondi Murthy and we'll be calling it a stable set. Uh, sir, I had a question. Yeah, go ahead, Surya. So is finding a stable set of the graph and be complete? Right. So, well, finding one is easy, but I, what you meant, I think, is finding the biggest one. Uh, yes, sir. Right. And uh, that follows from our previous discussion because computing the clique is NP hard. Right. So, computing a maximum clique is NP hard. And now can you tell me why computing a maximum stable set is also NP hard? Uh, because we can find that through complementation. Exactly, exactly. So a clique becomes a stable set. And so both of these are NP hard, right? So unfortunately, computing omega G and alpha G are both NP hard problems. Uh, when you talk about computational problems, uh, you cannot refer to them as NP complete. Um, I mean, these are complexity theoretic uh, technicalities. I don't want to get into that. NP completeness can only be used for decision problems. So deciding whether it is equal to three or greater than three. Uh, but when you are talking about computation problems or optimization problems, uh, you can't really refer to NP completeness. That's just an aside. Okay. 
but the crux of the matter is still the same uh, you can't compute them efficiently unless p is equal to np so that conclusion is still valid um give me a second there's something on my screen okay okay good so we got one lower bound from the clique number turns out we can also get a lower bound from the stability number and let's think about that notice that if you can color the graph with uh, k colors then each color class is a stable set right we discussed this in the previous lecture as well or the last to last one um right so in this example what we could do is um we have a red colored class of the peterson graph we can color the remaining vertices with uh, more colors clearly we have we can't use the red color anymore right so now let's suppose i color this green uh, then i can't color this green maybe i can color this one green and maybe i can color this one green okay and now i can color the remaining vertices blue okay but the point is that each color class is a stable set and the stable sets have size at most alpha of g so using this we can get another lower bound on the chromatic number okay so let's go through that um suppose that g is k chromatic right so the chromatic number is exactly equal to k that means that the vertex set of g admits a partition v0 v1 v2 up to sorry maybe i should start from v1 my bad v1 v2 up to vk such that the graph induced well such that each vi is a stable set in um, g well that in particular means that the cardinality of each vi is at most the stability number of the graph okay and uh, the size of v is simply the sum of the vi's right and that is at most k times alpha of g right and k is nothing but our chromatic number right so this gives you another lower bound the chromatic number is at least the number of vertices in the graph divided by the stability number right uh, or if you are using notation for the number of vertices then it is v over alpha okay so that gives us yet another lower bound on the chromatic number but again not a very useful one because uh, it's np hard to compute the stability number of a graph right uh in the case of the peterson graph we can see that the size of the it's uh, got 10 vertices and the size of the maximum stable set is 4 so that's um 2.5 and so it's at least 3 and we already found the coloring using three colors so in this particular case um it's equal to 3 but you can see that the previous lower bound the click number 
in the Peterson graph, there are no triangles. So the clique number of the Peterson graph is equal to two. So in this particular case, turns out that the second lower bound is a better one. In general, I don't think one is better than the other. Okay. So let's have an example. Okay. So that's just some discussion on lower bounds for the um, chromatic number of a graph. There are other lower bounds, which uh, we are not discussing here. So let's, um, I think there are other lower bounds using uh, linear algebraic techniques, eigenvalues, and it's, uh, those kinds of things. But uh, I'm not covering those here. OK, so now that we have discussed some lower bounds, let's switch to some discussion about upper bounds. OK, we are going to discuss basically one upper bound. Um, that's going to lead us to one of the most important uh, fundamental theorems in um, chromatic graph theory, the study of graph colorings. So, well, to get an upper bound, you can just try coloring the graph, right? And if you can show that the graph has a coloring with a certain number of colors, a proper vertex coloring, then that is an upper bound. So, since there are no algorithms, we can try a heuristic. We can just try a greedy approach to coloring the vertices of a graph, okay? So, here is a greedy heuristic. Take any um, ordering of the vertices of the graph, OK? Consider any ordering of the vertices of a graph. Let's say v1, v2, v3, up to vn. And start coloring the vertices in this order. Whenever you color a vertex vi, you look at all of its neighbors that are already colored, and you give it the smallest color that is available that is not used by its neighbors. So think of your colors as being one, two, three, up to the number of colors. OK? Um, assign to each vi step by step. Uh, as per this order. Uh, the smallest color, the smallest color not used by any of its already colored neighbors, OK? Um, and when I say smallest color, I am implicitly assuming that our colors are 1, 2, 3, up to the number of colors. OK? Let's do a quick example. Supposing I have a complete bipartite graph um, minus a perfect matching. OK, and we already know what a perfect matching is. So I'm going to remove, um, I'm going to remove all of these three edges. OK? And then what I will get is a six cycle in this example. OK, supposing these, this is my graph. And let's say I label the vertices v1, v2, v3, v4, v5, 
v6. So let's say this is my ordering. I first color v1, then I color v2, and so on. So let's see what happens in this case. Well, let's say I color v1. So I give it um, the color 1. Now I come to v2, and its neighbors that are already colored are none. So I give it the color 1 again. Then I come to v3. v3 has a colored neighbor, v2, which is uh, 1. So I give v3 color 2. Now I come to v4, and uh, v4 has also got a colored neighbor, which is 1. So I give it 2 again. v5 has two colored neighbors, v2 and v4, that are colored 1 and 2. So I must use a color 3 here. And now again at v6, I will have to use a color 3. Right? You can try this on any complete bipartite graph, minus a perfect matching uh, with the conventions I'm using. So you can observe that in any complete bipartite graph, KPP minus a perfect matching, uh, this way of ordering leads to this ordering requires uh, P colors. So in this case, we had K33, we required three colors. Uh, of course, it's a bipartite graph, so you could just color with two colors. So this illustrates that the greedy heuristic can be really bad, right? Although you only need two colors, the particular ordering we have chosen is forcing us to use uh, P colors, where P is essentially the number of vertices or the order of the number of vertices, right? The number of vertices is 2P, right? Okay, so... Okay, so that's a that's not a very good heuristic, which is what I'm trying to illustrate uh, by this example, but it is still a heuristic. Maybe it still gives us some upper bound. So, so clearly, not a good heuristic. Um, because we don't know how to order the vertices. It is um, probably you can do this as an exercise. If the chromatic number of a graph is equal to k, then there exists an ordering of the vertices of G that uses precisely k colors uh, using the greedy heuristic. So there is always an ordering which will give you the chromatic number. Unfortunately, computing this order is as hard as computing the chromatic number. Computing this order is as hard as computing the chromatic number of the graph. OK? Any questions at this point? OK. Um, if not, I want to ask the question. What is the maximum number of, um, maybe not, that's not the way I want to put it. Is there an interesting upper bound um, based on this heuristic. So what I'm asking is, this is the way we are coloring. Can you give me a good upper bound, a non-trivial interesting upper bound? Exactly. So Shivam has it. It's a maximum degree plus one, right? 
because whenever you color a vertex whenever you color a vertex and you look at already colored neighbors of the vertex well the degree of the vertex is something let's say let's say in this case it is 4 so there may be some colored vertices and some uncolored neighbors so let's say these are colored and these are not colored but in any case the number of colored neighbors cannot be more than the degree of that vertex right so if you had delta plus one colors where delta is the maximum degree of the graph you will always have one color available for the vertex v and that holds for every vertex so you will never require more than the maximum degree plus one colors okay so if we have delta g plus 1 colors where this is the maximum degree among all vertices if we have that many colors then for each vertex v there is always a color available right and so that gives us the following upper bound that the chromatic number of a graph is at most the maximum degree plus 1 okay because the greedy heuristic will never require more than these many colors right okay good so how good is this upper bound is it best possible in general are there graphs that require these many colors complete graphs yes it is best possible because in a complete graph you actually need the maximum degree plus one colors so complete graphs are an example are there any other examples that you can think of or that you already know of are there any other graphs that require the maximum degree plus 1 colors odd cycles great in a cycle the maximum degree is 2 well it's a two regular graph if it is even you can just color the vertices alternate red blue red blue and the graph is bipartite you're done the problem is if it is odd you can't have a two vertex coloring it's not bipartite and you can see that three colors suffice you can color red blue red blue and then the last vertex you give it a third color green okay so this is best possible in this particular very strict sense but there is a really cool theorem that says that it's actually not best possible you can improve it slightly um and the theorem says that except for complete graphs and odd cycles you never require the maximum degree plus one colors maximum degree will suffice okay so that brings us to um one of the most fundamental results in chromatic graph theory uh called brooks theorem Let me just uh, see the number. Mm. What is the number? Yeah, fourteen point four. So if G is a connected graph, so yeah, it's um, if you have two odd cycles, then uh, 
two vertex system and odd cycles, then again, you need delta G plus one colors. So we can restrict ourselves to connected graphs. G is a connected graph that is not a complete graph or an odd cycle. Then the theorem says that the chromatic number of the graph is at most the maximum degree of the graph. You don't need the plus one. Okay. Great. So proving Brooks theorem is going to be our main goal for the next lecture. But I want to spend the remaining uh, eight minutes or so to give you some intuition on how we are going to proceed. Okay. Are there any questions at this point? Okay. So let's say towards a proof of Brooks theorem. So it's a theorem that I have read multiple times during my own uh, PhD and uh, maybe even in my master's. Um, I've read multiple proofs of it, but this is the first time I feel that I have <laughs> truly understood why the theorem statement holds. I've understood proofs, but I think this is the first time I feel like, oh, now I see why this is true. So hopefully I'll be able to uh, deliver the same. Let's see. Okay. So let's say G is a connected simple graph. Okay. So I want to start with a question. We are going to use the greedy heuristic. The idea behind proving Brooks theorem is actually to get a greedy to get an ordering of the vertices so that the greedy heuristic will require no more than delta g colors the main idea the main idea so g is a connected simple graph and um, okay so to show that if g is not a complete graph or an odd cycle, then there exists an ordering of the vertices so that the greedy heuristic requires at most the maximum degree colors. Okay, so this is what we are going to do. For all graphs except complete graphs and odd cycles, we will find an ordering that does not require more than delta G colors. Okay. Um, we'll get there. Let's come back to having a connected simple graph. Okay, I'm not making any other assumptions. It could be a complete graph. It could be an odd cycle. I don't care. Okay. Um, but it is connected. That is crucial. What I want to do is I want to get an ordering of the vertices so that whenever I color a vertex, it has at least one uncolored neighbor. Clearly, this cannot happen for the last vertex. But for all other vertices, I want it to be true that there is always one uncolored neighbor. So can we find an ordering of the vertices 
of G such that each time we color a vertex except the last one in the ordering, there is an uncolored neighbor. I want you all to think about this for a few minutes or, or whatever it requires. We have a connected simple graph based on degree in increasing order. Hmm. Sort based on degree in increasing order. So first I take a vertex. So let's see. Supposing I have this graph. OK, one. OK, so how would I do it? I first put this vertex degree in increasing order. Then I put this one. Then I put this one and then I put this one. Does this work? I color one. That's true. And I color two. Hmm. So if you put the degrees in increasing order, then this will work. Is that true? That may not be true in general, Shivam says. Do you see a counter example? Or is it uh, just a gut feeling at this point? I also feel it may not be true, but I don't see a counter example right away. Two stars, we are one vertex. You mean something like, like this? OK, so what happens in this case? I color this vertex. This is 1, this is 2, this is 3, and this is 4. Uh, whenever I color a vertex, I have at least one uncolored neighbor. Right, this is not true here, is it? Join another star. OK, so here it's not true. Something like this. Maybe you can uh, tell me what the edges of the graph are. OK, so now OK, so yeah, I'm not sure exactly what the counter example is. But let's, let's do the following to the leaves. I see. Something like this, maybe. OK, so OK, so think of a counter example. So let's discuss this offline, maybe on Piazza or something. OK, so one possible idea is sort degrees in uh, increasing order. So the question is, does it work? I don't know. I'll have to think about it. Um, opposite order of DFS. So I like this. Ravi, can you explain a bit more? Opposite order of DFS. So I was just thinking that if we require, like if we do it in opposite order of DFS, then to each to a vertex, we require the predecessor of that vertex. And if we're doing hmm. it in opposite okay. order. OK, good. Yeah, good. So I'm going, to, um, uh, I'm going to throw out the DFS part of it. I'm going to keep the spanning tree part of it. OK, so let's take a spanning tree. OK, so I, I think what you're saying actually works. Opposite order of DFS, I think, is exactly what I'm saying, uh, just in a slightly more graph theoretic uh, terms. So take a spanning tree of the graph, and now keep removing leaves. And if you do that, 
then you will definitely uh, get an ordering with these properties. Okay, so this is an idea that works. Take a spanning tree. of the graph and keep removing leaves. Okay. Another way to think of it, uh, it's essentially the same uh, point. Root the spanning tree at some vertex. Your graph is connected. So there is a spanning tree. So let's say this is the root. Now I'll keep removing vertices. Uh, first one, then this is a leaf. So two, then now this vertex is a leaf. I could remove that. I could remove this, 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 and so on and so forth. And the last vertex I remove will be the root. Okay. So I have rooted the spanning tree just for the sake of visualization. Okay. And uh, this will give an ordering with the property that we want. The only vertex where you cannot have an uncolored neighbor is because it's the root, right? Because all the uh, vertices have been colored. So clearly that cannot hold for the root. Okay. Um, you may root it at some vertex. Okay. <clears throat> Good. So what does this mean? This means that if I take this ordering, then I will require the color Delta G plus one. If I have Delta plus one colors, I will require the last color only for the root vertex because for every other vertex, I will have one uncolored neighbor, which means that at most Delta, minus one neighbors would be colored. So even if I have just Delta colors, I will be able to color all vertices except one vertex. So the conclusion from this is, and I will conclude the lecture at this point, then G admits a partial Um, delta G partial proper delta G vertex coloring um, such that all vertices except perhaps one vertex which is the root of your tree will be colored. So this is a statement for all connected graphs. This is true by the observation we just made. Take a spanning tree and keep coloring by removing the leaves. The only vertex we are not going to color is the last vertex, the root. But all other vertices can be colored using Delta G colors. And this will be a proper coloring. It's just that it's not uh, it's not coloring the whole graph. There is one vertex, the root that has not been colored and observe that in complete graphs and odd cycles, you can always make sure this is actually better to see in an odd cycle. You can always make sure that there is exactly one vertex that receives the last color, right? So in an odd cycle, you can give the colors one, two, one, two, one, two, and it's only the last vertex that is creating a problem. And you use the color three there. Okay. So this is the key observation we are going to use. And we are going to try to find a spanning tree with some special properties to prove Brooks theorem. Okay. So we'll continue from here. And uh, just a quick um, spoiler. We will be using a bunch of things you proved in assignment two to prove Brooks theorem. Okay. So we'll continue from here tomorrow. Are there any questions? I'm still here for another four or five minutes. And uh, please think about this idea 
and maybe if anyone finds a counter example maybe share it on the group or share it on piazza or something a cycle is a counter example for increasing degree order okay let's this is an example i can draw easily um so here i can take any order right because all vertices are right and so yeah so because all orders um satisfy the increasing order so i could color this first then i could color this and now i could color 3 but all of its neighbors already colored okay so that question is answered yes there might exist some order where it works fair enough but then the question is how do we find that order right so so it would be nice to find a stronger counter example where none of the orders as per the increasing uh, degree order works maybe uh, how about sort an increasing order delete the vertex modify the degrees and then sort again i don't know maybe it works maybe then you can also show that there is a spanning tree which gives you the same order so yeah these are good questions i haven't thought about all of these So I would think that any uh, order that works can also pro probably give you a spanning tree which generates the same order. That would be my uh, uh, wild guess. Perhaps one can uh, prove that. So take an ordering that works, that has the property, and from that see if you can construct a spanning tree uh, that will give you the same ordering. Okay. If there are no questions or concerns, uh, please feel free to leave the meeting. I'll probably stop recording, anyways. <laughs>